Hello, everybody. Thanks, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, very happy to introduce you all to the presidential panel of the 78th A American Society of Criminology meeting. My name is Shad Maruna, and uh, for the next 80 minutes, I am the president of the ASC. Uh, as you will know, uh, yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I hand over to, to Val Jenis at, at the end of this, and, and, and we'll be passing her this gavel, uh, and, at which point my, my time is over. But that is only the second most exciting thing that, that I get to hand over tonight, uh, as excited as I am for that moment. The, the, the most exciting thing, and probably the best part about being president, although there's many, many rewarding aspects, and I've had a, a, I'll, I'll get the chance to thank a, a lot of people here in a moment. But the most uh, um, exciting uh, uh, part about being the president is getting the chance to choose the President's Justice Award winner. Um, 22 years ago, the ASC created the President's Award for Distinguished Contributions to Justice to honor an individual or organization who through either a single initiative or over a long period of time has made significant and distinguished contributions to the cause of justice. It is, I think, the most important award we give out as an organization as it really captures our values and our ethos, the, the heart and soul of, of the ASC. And, and, and we've had some incredible recipients of this prize over the last two decades, ranging from the Fortune Society in, the, in New York, Senator John Lewis, Brian Stevenson, Jody Owens, Carol Tracy, Latifa, Sum, uh, sorry, Latifa Simon, uh, Barney Frank, and the Alliance for Safety and Justice last year. Um, but the award has a, a really broad remit, a, a, as you've already heard, and I have to say it was extraordinarily difficult for me to choose a single person or organization when I think about all the, the activists, all the advocates, all the community leaders I've worked with in, in, in my three decades doing this work. How can you just pick one person or even one organization to recognize an, a, 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 as the representative role model with so many people working so hard uh, on these issues at the moment. In the end, I, I decided that, that actually if our aim is, is to recognize those who have made a significant and distinguished contribution to the cause of justice, as, as it says in the description, then for the most part, individuals and organizations may not be the right focus. Significant change, as we all know in social science, um, um, generally comes about as a result not of the action of specific actors uh, or, 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 or organizations, but rather by social movements. As social scientists, we know this, we write about the power that social movements have like no other to affect change. But often when we give our awards, uh, like, like I had the privilege of doing on Wednesday night, we tend to focus on individuals and, and, and the, the impact that they make. And we, we, we forget that when it comes to, to, to science uh, or, or social justice, it's the we rather than the I that, that matters. Um, so I decided to recognize with my award this year, not a single individual or even an organization, but rather uh, uh, the formerly incarcerated, convicted people and families movement, or uh, the FICPFM. Now, now that name is quite a mouthful, even the acronym, but FICPFM, I'm gonna get faster saying it as we go, FICPFM make no apologies for this. FICPFM is meant to be an inclusive, meant to be an encompassing, a welcoming umbrella, like, like that ever-growing acronym LGBTQ+. Um, in a key report, the organization writes, FICPFM's name is cumbersome, true, but unapologetically so. It intentionally honors and embraces all of those whose lives are directly impacted by mass incarceration and criminalization, and therefore we have a vested stake in their dismantling. FICPFM is not a single organization, but a national network of over 50 civil and human rights organizations that are led by people who are living with criminal records and their family members. They are a national movement of directly impacted people speaking in their own voices about the need to, add, to end mass incarceration. America's current racial and economic caste system. Their own voices is the key phrase here. Uh, in my early years as a criminologist, I think I used to dream, used to fantasize about being a voice for the formerly incarcerated myself. And that came from a noble place, it came from a decent place, 
But as my friend Paula Harriet used to say to me, she'd say, we don't need you to give us a voice. We've already got a voice. And if you, if you just shut up long enough, you would hear it. Uh, <laughs> Paula would have liked to have been here tonight. She, she couldn't be. Um, she did, uh, uh, um, um, however, uh, uh, um, it got me thinking that, that uh, uh, rather than doing a presidential lecture here today, I'd much rather do a presidential listen, uh, uh, although I'm not sure I, I would get away with that, but I've certainly told Britt that she can have this mic as long as she wants, as long as I hand over the gavel and, and, and 80 minutes. Um, I chose FICPFM for this award because they perfectly embody and embrace everything I wanted to say in tonight's presidential address and in my current research. Committed to transforming society by transforming the criminal legal system, they advocate legislatively, judicially, and through direct organizing and stakeholder education. Working in and with communities, their work addresses head on the collateral consequences of living with a conviction by restoring civil rights to those who have had them taken away. As everyone in this room knows, the US leads the world in the number of people it incarcerates, but it also leads the world in the number of people, tens of millions, who have been released from prison, sometimes decades before, but are still suffering the collateral consequences of those convictions. The people who encompass the, the FIC, PFM, uh, have borne those consequences, either through or either because they were convicted themselves or because they were in close relationship with someone who was. These voices matter, uh, and indeed they may be the only force, as I'll argue in my talk, that can actually challenge the evil of mass incarceration and the untold damage it has done to the fabric of American society. Representing the organization and, and collecting the award on their behalf is FICPFM's Director of Special Programming, Britt White. Britt White is a Texas-based organizer, strategist, and trainer. She centers her work on ensuring that, that women and their unique experiences in America's criminal justice system are not erased from conversations or solutions related to gun violence and mass incarceration. Britt has participated in panels, trainings, and conferences across the country and has had the opportunity to directly question numerous presidential candidates about their criminal justice platforms and their commitment to those impacted by the, the justice system. Um, she she uh, was recently a Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard where she was attached to the Institute to End Mass Incarceration at Harvard Law. Uh, she, she also has created a, a training institute named after her parents, the, the, the Shelley and Felton White Training Institute, where she trains justice-impacted people in community organizing. Uh, so with, with no further ado, it's my distinct honor to give the Justice Award to, to our to Chris White. And most importantly, to give her the podium, too. What up, y'all? Everybody looks like they're very conferenced out, so I invite you to take a breath. And in the tradition of my Baptist faith, I will not be long before you. It is with such extreme honor that I am able to represent my organization, the formerly incarcerated and convicted people and family movement, and receive this prestigious award. It is always a moment where I take a breath whenever we are recognized and celebrated for our work, because often in this country, I have felt like a modern day leper that once you are branded as a person with a conviction that you can no longer have a life full of dignity. So in my time before you, because I'm a person who likes to know where are we going with this, I'm gonna share a little bit about my story, the story of the movement, and then things that I'll lay out before you that I'll hope you all will consider as social scientists. Is that okay? All right, because we gonna talk back to me today. Is that all right? <laughs> So, my name is Brittany White. I go by Britt because Brittany seems to be very difficult for people in America to say. And I'm originally from Dayton, Ohio. I'm a Midwest girl by birth. <clears throat> I come from a two-parent household where my father is my hero and my mother is my accountability. Both of my parents have master's degrees. Most of my grandparents, three of my grandparents, also were educated people. 
And so I do not come from the stereotypical background of a person with a conviction. As my parents' youngest child, their hope for me was that I would go to college, get educated, become a psychologist, have a family, and live a pretty niche traditional life. But growing up in Dayton, Ohio, I always share with people that when I was incarcerated at the age of 23, that was not the first time that I lived behind bars. It was actually in the early 90s when I was incarcerated in my neighborhood in Five Oaks in Dayton, Ohio. My parents received notice along with my neighbors that they would be barricading us inside of our community, literally building up gates at the end of our streets that no longer allowed traffic to flow in and out of our neighborhood. And now looking back upon that experience, I have such a different analysis of what happened, that the city of Dayton could have chosen to invest the resources that they did to barricade us in our neighborhoods to build a community garden, to build a recreational center, or anything else that may have fed into our socioeconomical needs and give us the ability to thrive. But much like the school of thought that was prevalent at that time, they criminalized the people in the neighborhood and barricaded us inside of our homes. So now ambulances weren't able to get through easier and the Donato's pizza place down the streets no longer delivered to that part of town. And so what does that say about the trajectory of children who grow up incarcerated in their homes? What does that do to their imagination and their ability to thrive when the city quits on them before they even reach middle school. These experiences were not just unique to me. Unfortunately, many of my comrades and colleagues across the country have had similar experiences of having the city and the government not invest in their well-being. But fortunately, my parents relocated us to Texas to give us a better quality of life. Well, within 11 months of us moving to Texas, my dad woke up one day and had a seizure. We discovered he had a malignant brain tumor. And so the sole provider of our household then went on permanent disability. And I began to question a lot of things that I thought to be true and thought to be real. And so I left Texas at the age of 18, went to Ohio, went to college ended up messing up in college and moved to Atlanta. When I moved to Atlanta at 20 years old, it was with the support of my family to get back into college and get my life back together. I was not yet emotionally mature. I didn't have the language around trauma or the skill sets to deal with the things that I embarked upon. So I did what I believe was the solution to all my problems. I thought money could fix everything wrong in my life and I pursued it. And that pathway took me to the Department of Corrections in the state of Alabama. Although I was living in Atlanta at the time, I caught a trafficking marijuana charge in the state of Alabama. And as if incarceration is not bad enough itself, but when you're incarcerated in a place that you are not from, it makes your time even more difficult. One of the reasons for that is because in prison life, people tend to click up by the cities that they're from. So the Montgomery girls hang out, the Huntsville girls hang out, and here I am <clears throat> without a delegation. Throughout that experience, it was, it was mortifying. The, the thing that I remember being arrested is, please do not let my mama find out that I am in jail. If we could just resolve this situation before Shelly finds out, everything will be great. Of course, that didn't happen. I am one of the few people who decided to exercise my right to go to a jury trial. And within two days, I was convicted of a group of people who were not my peers. The judge allowed me to sit in the county jail for three more months while he decided what he should do to me. And in January of 2010, he sentenced me to a 20-year split five-year sentence. That means you serve every day of five years on a 20-year sentence, and if you get into any trouble while you're in prison, they can pull your split and put you on a straight 20. <laughs> 
So many people ask me, what is prison like for women? And what I would like you to know is it's a place without smells. It's a place without taste. It's a place without pleasure. Actually, pleasure is actually criminalized in every way that you could think. Hanging out with your friends is fraternizing, and that's an offense that can land you in um, solitary confinement. Anything that brings you joy can be taken away from you at any given moment. The last experience I'll share with you is I did not get many visits because my parents lived in Texas and I was incarcerated in Alabama. And the one visit, one visit that I got during that time, my parents drove, my mom and my brother drove all the way from Texas to see me in prison and I put on my best white uniform, I got dressed, had my lip gloss popping, only to find out that they were late. And I'm steady looking at the clock like they told me they were coming. Where could they be? 20 minutes left of visitation, I walk out into the visitation room to find my brother and my mom standing there. And my mom shared with me that <clears throat> the correctional officer did not know how to process an out-of-state ID. So I lost about one hour and 40 minutes of my visit with them while they figured out how to process them. You have a unique experience in the lens of the criminal legal system when you are in the belly of the beast. It's one thing to study a thing in isolation and be divorced, and it is sanitary, and it is a subject matter, but it's a totally different thing when it's your lived experience and it's your life and your freedom on the line. I experienced so many moments of injustice and disgust that I deeply was frustrated and came home looking for an avenue and a pathway to highlight my unique experience within the criminal legal system. And I am so grateful that a movement that I did not even know exists was beginning to thrive and build momentum right at the moment that I came home in 2014. What is so powerful about this formerly incarcerated movement is that it took people like myself who have been called convicts and had our dignity stripped away from us and told us that we were experts. That our unique perspective gave us the best experience and the right to highlight what needed to be changed within this system. That who we could be if we put our imaginations and our grit together and begin to construct and architect a world and society where people are not villainized or actually given the advantages to thrive. A society where we have not protected children, where we have left them in homes to grow up and experience things that take away from their dignity. And then once they turn 18, we lose tolerance of them and we hide them away because we, as a society, have not figured out a way to help those folks. Those are the people that I want to work with for the rest of my life. Those are the people that I want to demand that we find solutions to empower and give them every single advantage that they say that they can't have. When I was just a person who was 272433, my Department of Corrections number, I did not get many letters. I did not get many invitations. I did not get many prestigious awards. But most recently, because I was able to have a prestigious fellowship at Harvard, it has given me a credibility to be able to tell my story. And my story is very much about the women who are left in these systems, in these jails, in these prisons across the country who do not have a pathway home, who are waiting for Supreme Court justices to change, who are waiting for presidents to change, who are waiting for politicians to care, but most of all, waiting for us as a society to have a moral conscience, that they have talents and lives that are worth living. I stand before you all with a plea that you continue to remember that these are not data and numbers, but people. People who have children and families who want them to return home. 
People who are better than the worst decision or circumstance that they have ever been put in. People who have really not been afforded the legal expertise and muscle to be able to contend with the government for your freedom, who has all of the resources and the advantages. So this movement, this beautiful movement of justice-impacted people who are restoring voting rights to people all across the country to be able to say, just because you made a mistake, just because you have a conviction, you should not lose your right to contend in the public arena. You should not lose your rights of citizenship in this country. One of the most valued and cherishable rights in this democracy that we live in, you too get to engage and have a vote, have a right, have a say so about how decisions get made over your life every single day. You all, it is gritty. Working in the movement is not eloquent speeches, it's not marches, it's not Sean King tweeting things out every single day. <laughs> it's stacking chairs. It's knocking on doors. It's getting to know people who you feel you have nothing in common on and seeing if you can just move one inch in the middle and find commonality to recognize their humanity, but also to make a case for your own. It's really about dignity. It's about saying, this is the thing that is most important to me. My, we call it self-interest. The thing I'm not willing to compromise on that makes me human. Even if it is as small as I want to get off work every single day, walk to the corner store and buy me a beer without being harassed by the police. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to make sense to you. It's just the thing that you care about. And I think that's beautiful and I think that's righteous. <clears throat> and if we pair that together, with our shared collective interests of the world you want to see and the things that mean the most to you, then now we have built collective power. Now we have an opportunity to be architects over a world that exemplifies dignity and is truly inclusive. It's really about giving everybody an opportunity to have a seat at the table. My charge to you all is I just want to be in collaboration. So many times I go to meetings and they try to talk big words and stats and numbers and tell me that what I'm asking for, I haven't presented a case. I don't have studies around it. I don't have data around it. And if we could just be in partnership and you could give me the credibility and put the stats by the stories and the cases where I can point to the heart of the pain. I could tell you the zip code where people are going to prison at the highest rate in my city. Most formerly incarcerated people can. No, I don't have five years worth of study and data around it, but I know because I live there. But you do. And I want to know, what are you doing with this research that you're holding on to? Are you hoarding all of this power for arrogant brilliance? because your institution makes you put all of these papers out so you can get tenure, or because you actually care about the society that we're building and you see the value of being in relationship with organizers and people who live in these communities and are from them. Secondly, I would say, I would like to see more people who look like myself. I think representation is so important. This is a nice room. There's more women in here than I gave y'all credit for. <laughs> I'm a girl's girl. But I would specifically like to see more young black women, more formerly incarcerated people, more folks from areas and neighborhoods who grew up like myself. And it is very important the lens experience perspective they bring. So if you have the ability to sponsor someone, to speak up for someone from that background, to have this position, I really challenge you to do so. And lastly, I will say, I hope you are using your imagination. When I went to Harvard, I think I was shocked at how cerebral it was. Everybody was thinking really heady, important stuff, and it seemed almost as if they were losing their humanity to meet their deadlines. Mm. I challenge you not to lose your personhood 
as you become more prestigious and profound in your career. Don't sacrifice your humanity. <clears throat> Don't lose your humanness. Because that is the theme that keeps us connected. Once again, my organization is extremely grateful. If you seek to know more about us, please check out FICPFM.org for opportunities to donate and volunteer. And thank you so much.